suspense. With us again, our star is Mr. Orson Welles, in the third of four successive appearances for the suspense audience. And sharing honors with Mr. Wells this evening is a lovely and distinguished Hollywood leading lady, Miss Geraldine Fitzgerald. Our play tonight is from a short story by Agatha Christie. And so with Philomel Cottage, and with the performances of Geraldine Fitzgerald as Alex Martin, and of Orson Welles as her devoted husband, Gerald, we again hope to keep you in suspense. Reading the sign over the gate. What does Philomel mean? Are you joking? No, really. <laughs> Why, you little cockney. You've been here for three weeks and you still don't know. Philomel hmm. is another name for the bird that's supposed to sing only for lovers. You've been hearing it every twilight. Oh, Nightingale. Of course. That sign, Philomel Cottage, is the main reason I wanted to pay for it. Glad you bought it. Gerald, this is a 50 50 investment and you know it. Huh. Fifty, fifty, a thousand pounds for me and two from you. What else could we do? You couldn't touch any more of your capital at the time, and... Well, when you find a country cottage that combines old world charm with new world plumbing, you want to grab it. And... <laughs> and we did have to have the place, didn't we? Yes, we did. I've often wondered if you weren't a bit lonely. Lonely? With you? I mean, well, after living the city all your life, pretty much to ourselves, you know. Two miles from the nearest neighbor. From the nearest eavesdropper, you mean. Hmm. What an utterly hopeless romantic I met. <laughs> well, you can't get out of it now. No. Oh, Gerald, you know what day today is? Today is the 13th. It's our anniversary, darling. We've known each other exactly a month. No, exactly 30 days. <laughs> oh, Gerald, really now? No, really. What is it, dear? Do you have the pain again? No. Just a little indigestion, I think. <laughs> There. You want me to get to your pill? No, 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 no. Well, there's 11.25. Better get on to the village. Now to get that camera equipment. And the human timetable walks through the garden gate. My dear, there's nothing wrong with system, even on a honeymoon. Sooner I go, sooner I get back. Oh, come on, Gerald. Forget your old photography. Why don't you stand and do some gardening? To be good for you. Well, for old George, he gets paid for it. He's not due again until Saturday. The place will go to rack and ruin. Over my dead body. Goodbye, dear. Don't walk too fast, dear. Remember the last time. Be careful, darling. <laughs> Just slipped out. Be careful. Alex Martin swinging there on the garden gate, smiling out of happiness across a part of England that was as remote and placid as any you'd care to find, wondered why she'd said such a ridiculous thing. If this were London, say, that would have... Hmm. London. And slowly the smile fell away. She knew then that the memory of that last week in London had never really been far from her mind. That and that last talk with Dick... On the top deck of the bus crossing Trafalgar Square. She'd never seen him like that before. Gerald Martin. I tell you, Alex, the man's a perfect stranger to you. You know nothing about him. I know that I love him. How can you know in a week? You've only met him. It doesn't take everyone seven years to find out they're in love with a girl. It's meant for me, isn't it? Alex. It's no use. Alex, don't you know what it's been for me not being able to tell you? I couldn't, not with the income I had. Then I decided I couldn't wait anymore, and I was going to tell you anyway. And you know what happened? No, I'm afraid I don't. Oh, yes, you do. That money you inherited. That money from your cousin or uncle or whoever. I don't see what that... You didn't think I could ask you to marry me then, did you? You don't think I could live off your money? I'm sorry, Dick. Believe me, I am. But but it really doesn't matter now, one way or the other. Doesn't matter, does it? You can bet it matters to that Martin chap. That's what he's after. You mark my words, he's after your money. Dick, it might interest you to know that Gerald has money of his own far more than I have. And more than I have. Maybe that's the difference. Oh, I've had enough of this. I'm getting over the next stop. Alex, please. All right, but let me tell you something. If you think I'm going to let Gerald cut me out and not do anything about it, you're very much mistaken. I'll catch up with him, do you hear? I'll catch up with him if it's the last thing I do. I'll catch up. 
catch up with him if it's the last thing I do. To Alex, that threat of just one month ago was merely a heat of the moment outburst of her pride. And yet as she leaned on the gate of Philomel Cottage, it kept echoing in her mind. What swept it away, what brought her back to the rustic idyllic happiness of her life with Gerald Martin was the ring of the telephone inside the cottage. Who could be calling? Gerald, Gerald had hardly had time to get beyond the turn in the road. Except if, if something had happened to him. If he'd had another attack. Maybe one of the villagers was trying to call to say that he... Well, she hurried then, and her hand shook a trifle. Hello? Alex? This is Dick. What? Who did you say? Dick? Why, Alex, what's the matter with your voice? I wouldn't have known it. It's Dick. Dick Wonderbird. Oh. Well, where are you? At the Traveler's Arms. That is the right name, isn't it? Or aren't you acquainted with your village pub? You mean you're here? Yes, I'm on a holiday doing a bit of fishing. Any objection to my looking up you two good people this afternoon? Oh, no. No, no, you mustn't. Why, Alex? I beg your pardon. Of course, I won't bother you. If you'd rather I do... I'm sorry, Dick. I... I only meant to be away this afternoon. Won't you come this evening? Thanks very much, but I'll probably be away by then. Depends upon whether a pal of mine turns up or not. Goodbye, Alex. Goodbye, Dick, and I hope that... Best of luck. For a long moment, Alex stood quite still, the memory of Dick's threat flooding her mind. She walked across the spacious oak beamed living room, and by the time she reached the side porch, she'd made up her mind. Much as she hated deceit, she would say nothing to Gerald of Dick's call. She stepped out into the garden, and for the second time that morning, got a surprise. There, big as life, was her gardener, busily trimming the hedge. Why, George, I thought we agreed that Saturday was your day here. I thought as I'd just be surprised, Mrs. Martin. It will be a fair over to Squires on Saturday, and I says to myself, I says... Mr. and Mrs. Martin, they won't take it amiss if I come for once on a Wednesday instead of a Saturday. <laughs> no, of course not, George. Then I thought, too, as I might as well see before he goes away so as to learn your wishes with the boarders. Before I go away? To London tomorrow. Hmm, going to London tomorrow? Where did you hear that? Met Mr. Martin down the village yesterday. He told me you were both going away to London tomorrow. And it was uncertain when you'd be back again. I didn't. <laughs> now, don't tell me you and the master is disagreeing already. Hmm? Oh, no, naturally not. The trip just, just slipped my mind. Get on to work, George. Yes, ma'am. Never could understand why anybody'd want to go up to London, though. Like Mr. Raines, what used to have this house. He went up there. I shall remind you. Yes. And after fixing up this place like he did, with hats all over everywhere, well, you're going to take a loss, I says to him, when I sees the place up for sale. Ain't everyone as well as you're fed for washing themselves in every room in this house, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> but George, he says to me, I'll get every penny of two thousand pounds for this house. And sure enough, he did. He got three thousand. Two thousand. And he was asking was talked of at the time. Well, how do you figure it was thought to be? No, George. You see, I gave two and, uh, well, it really was 3000 yeah, You don't tell me that Mr. Raines had the face to stand up to say 3000 freezing like in a loud voice. He didn't say it to me. He said it to my husband. I guess I'll do some speeding now. The price was... As Alex strolled on across the garden, she was conscious of a thin, vague thought struggling to make itself heard. Then, abruptly, it was gone. Her eye had fallen upon a small, dark green object lying in the furrow beside one of the flower beds. Her husband's pocket diary. She picked it up and opened it, scanning the entries with some amusement. Once again reminded of Gerald's enslavement to time and system. <laughs> it was the entry on page 21 that brought the smile from her face. April 14th. Mary Alex to St. Peter's Church, 2.30. <laughs> and it was the entry on page 30 that took that smile away. She stared, puzzled, at the date on the page. Wednesday, May 13th. Why, uh, 
for us today. Only one thing was written there in red pencil. 6 p.m. What was to happen at 6 p.m.? As she stood there, that small, vague thought struggled to be heard once more. It was... Yes, it was something Dick Winder that it said. Not the threat, not that wild, silly promise of vengeance, but, but something else. And then it came. What did she know about him? After all, he... Gerald, my husband. I love him. I trust him. But... Then she thought once again of that cryptic entry. 6 p.m. It was just 3 o'clock when Gerald, his arms laden with packages, walked up the garden path and came onto the side porch. Well, Eric. The moment he opened the door into the living room... She noticed the rather odd kind of excitement about him. There you are. <laughs> Miss me, darling. Oh, why wouldn't I? You've had time to buy out the whole village. <laughs> Only the camera's up. Now, if I don't have the best equipped dark room this side of London, it won't be my fault. If you're not careful, that dark room of yours is going to overflow the whole cellar. <laughs> oh, incidentally, here's something you've been watering the flowers with. Mm-hmm. Cash. Yep. Oh. Diary. Dropped it in the garden, did uh-huh. I? <laughs> I know all your secrets now. <laughs> not guilty. Oh, I'm not so sure. What about your assignation at 6 p.m. today? What? Oh. oh, that. Well, you've caught me at last. It's an assignation with a very handsome young woman, quite remarkably like you would say. <laughs> <laughs> You're evading the issue. Not at all. Simply a reminder that I want you to help me develop some negatives this evening. At six o'clock. That's rather a peculiar time, isn't it? Peculiar? Yes, I'm usually preparing dinner at that hour. Well, no harm in delaying it a bit. We might have a sandwich or two and some coffee out on the porch. Before we work on the negatives, you mean? Yes, that'd be pleasant, won't it? You know something, Alex? I never found anybody yet who could touch your coffee. Oh. Really? That covers Australia and Canada, Oh, you and your mysterious past. Why do you say that? No reason, I... Oh, Gerald, I do wish I did know more about you. Alex, you're serious. I know, it's silly, but I... Darling. (laughs) I've told you all about me, my boyhood in Sydney, my life in Canada. Yes. (laughs) I see. You mean love affairs. You women are all alike. Well, but there must have been... There must have been other women. I mean, if only I... Do you think it wise, Alex, this Bluebeard chamber business? Hmm? Let's put your mind on such a subject anyway. Never mentioned it before. Oh, I don't know, Gerald. I've... I've been rather upset all day. I imagine I can thank old George for that. The God, Amy? <laughs> He had some ridiculous idea. We were going away to London. He said, you London. told him. Where did you see him? He came to work today instead of Saturday. You fool. Why, Gerald. Oh. I didn't get this collar off. Oh, Gerald. Lie down. Uh, Look, lie down here. Get some water. Here, darling. I'm all right. I'm all right. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, darling, getting you all upset. Just well, because of stupid old gardener. I, I made some weak joke to him about being off to London in the morning. He must have taken it seriously oh. or he didn't hear properly. You straightened him out, I suppose. Hardly. You know what a gossip he is. I didn't want the whole uh, village to think my husband was leaving me in the dark about his plans. Are you all right now? Uh, you... You told him we were going then. Naturally. Yes, of course. Sorry you were placed in that kind of situation, darling. I don't suppose you ran into anybody else today. This far from the world, Gerald? It isn't very likely, is it? Gerald. No, not another word. No, not another word. You aren't yourself now. It's quite plain. I want you to have a little rest. 
You'll be right as rain by six o'clock. Must you do those photographs tonight? After all, you don't seem so well. Yeah, you... when one sets a time to do something, one should stick to it. It's the only way to get through one's work. All right, up with you upstairs to bed now. Very well, dear. I'll be getting things arranged in the dark room. <laughs> a nightmare. Upstairs in her room, she told herself that there was no basis, no basis whatever for her state of mind. Still, the turmoil, the doubt, the odd, unaccountable sense of dread persisted and grew. Grew until... Softly, she opened the door. Stepped out upon the upstairs hallway. Quite clearly, she knew what she must do. Knew she must find some testimony to her husband's past. Something to reassure her. Something to kill that agonizing dread mounting within her. Strangely, she remembered that single locked drawer in Gerald's bureau. She tiptoed to the door at the head of the stairs, opened it, and entered her husband's room. Yes, the key. If only she could find the key that locked the drawer. But there was none in sight. She moved to the wardrobe, went through his coat pockets, and then there, the feet there on the floor, she saw it. Swiftly, she stepped to the bureau, inserted the key, and it worked. <laughs> Alex Martin opened the drawer, looked down upon a small packet of letters tied with a light blue ribbon. And when she saw the uppermost envelope, her face reddened with shame. Why, why, they're my letters? They were her own letters, love letters written to Gerald before they were married. And there was nothing else in the drawer save a roll of ancient faded newspaper clippings. Alex sighed with relief as she glanced at the top clipping. It was from an American paper, and it featured the trial of one Charles Lemaitre. Charles Lemaitre. A notorious swindler and bigamist. A skeleton had been found beneath the floor of his house, and most of the women he'd married had never been heard of again. Another of the clippings described Lemaitre's behavior in court, his interest in the cameras of the news photographers, his sensational escape from prison. Another displayed his picture, a long-bearded, scholarly-looking fellow. It reminded her of someone. But who? She couldn't tell. She glanced at the caption beneath the picture. Modern Bluebeard. Modern Bluebeard. Yes, that's what she read. Her eyes went back to the picture, and in a flash, they saw the resemblance. She ran through the other clippings. Dates had been found in the man's pocket diary. Dates it was contended when he had done away with his victims. He was an amateur photographer. He was from Sydney, from Canada. He was subject to heart attacks. He was, he was, yes. Dick had tried to warn her. Dick had been near her that morning. She turned him away. She... It was then that she noticed the sound. She turned toward the bright new pipe in the corner running up through the room. From below, near its base, something was striking that pipe. As though someone were... That was it. As though someone were digging. The matron was preparing the dark room for the latest one of his victims. Six o'clock. That was the date. Six o'clock. Less than an hour from now. Suddenly, all the jigsaw pieces shot into place. The money paid for the house, her money, her money only. The bond she'd entrusted for his keeping. And the... Suddenly, she heard no sound. The digging had stopped. She must have escaped from this house at once before he came up. The clip, right back in the door. Don't lock it, don't allow it, just get away. She rushed to the door, out to the hall, and stopped close. Me. I was just trying to find the nail file. Were you, dear? Well, there's nothing to look so guilty about now, is it? Well, come on down. Getting late, you know. Gerald, I... Just have time to make the coffee and sandwiches. Before we do the pictures, that is. I'll be right down, darling. As oh, as but I... we really mustn't delay, must we? Coming, Alex? Very well. Now, <laughs> oh, that's better. Here, let me give you a hand. Never mind, Alex. Alex, how cold you are. Cold? Yes, I am, Mark. Well, that will soon pass away, I'm sure. Hurry along, dear. Hurry along. Yes, into the kitchen. Alex, what is the matter? Nothing. I'll be all right. The kitchen. 
Yes, I'll fix for something in a second. You just sit here in the living room and... No, the porch. That'll be more comfortable, All won't right. it? And I'll be right with you. Splendid, Alex. I'll just... <laughs> no, of course not. What, Gerald? How rotten of me not to have suggested it. Since you're feeling a bit under par, you can probably do with some help. I'll come with you. She knew then that some way, somehow, she must get word to Dick Winterford. The fact that he might be gone by now, the memory of him telling her so, she resolutely put out of her mind. There must be no more panic. She must be in utter control of herself. Alex, carrying the coffee out to the porch, glanced at the clock upon the mantel. Ten minutes till six. Her very life hung by those next ten minutes. By her ability to think coolly and swiftly, because standing beside her was a man as determined as he was insane. A pity you're so abstracted, my dear. What? Why do you say that? Well, because you are missing the loveliest sight you're ever likely to see again. Look out beyond the garden. First soft shades of twilight. Mm hmm. Twilight. Over Philomel Cottage. Now, I say, Alex, you are below par. What do you mean? First time you've ever slipped on the coffee. You must have talked in the entire canister. I'll be more careful after this. Oh, dear. That's mine. Alex, mind. where are you going? Nothing to get excited about, it, Gerald. <laughs> I forgot to order meat for tomorrow. I'm huh? just going to phone the butcher. The butcher this time of evening? He generally... He generally stays late on Wednesdays. I'll be right back, darling. Don't shut the door, Alex. It keeps the insects out of the living room. <laughs> You're not afraid I'm going to make love to the butcher, are you? Operator, get me the traveler's arm, please. Hurry. Hello? Traveler's arm? Mr. Winterford, please. Winterford. What? You don't know if he's still there? Well, see, won't you? It's most important. Don't let me disturb you. Well, darling, you do. I hate anyone listening when I telephone. But I do, Gerald, truly. You're quite sure you're really calling the butcher? Why, I... as a matter of fact, I'm not sure. What? What I mean is... What are you talking about? I'm afraid I've got the wrong person. A perfect stranger. Don't understand. Someone I know nothing about. You know nothing about? Then why don't you hang up? Here, was the end of that wire? Let's... Hello? Hello? Dead. All right, my girl. I'll go get started. We're late now. Late? Besides, it's six... three minutes past six. Why, Gerald, it won't be six o'clock for eight minutes. Look uh -huh. at the clock there on the mantel. I don't go by that relic. I go by my own Gerald, wristwatch. listen. Stop pacing and listen to well? me. Well? I don't feel up to it tonight. I'm upset. I'm tired. Alex, I'm... I promise you, you won't be a bit tired after it's over. <laughs> I'm not going to wait one minute longer. I won't do it. Come along, I'm Alex. I'm fine with you. Come along. No. I'll carry you. No. Uh, you will, you hear no. Oh, well. I, I've got something to tell you. Something to confess. Confess? Yes, to confess. Something, something I ought to have told you before. I've had... I've had my secret past, too. Uh, <laughs> former lover, I suppose. In a way, but, but something else. You'd call it... Yes, I expect you'd call it a crime. Crime? Yes. I don't believe it. Yes. You better... You better sit down, Gerald. There. I, uh... I told you I'd never been married before. That wasn't entirely true. There, there was a marriage. When I was 22, he was an elderly man with a little property... I induced him to ensure his life in my favor. At one time... I was a nurse with with access to a number of poisons. There's one poison, a white powder, but you know something about poisons, perhaps? No, I know very little about them. This one is very much like... It's absolutely untraceable. Any doctor would give a certificate of heart failure, and that 
understand that? <laughs> no. No, I, I can't tell you. No, no. <laughs> Another time, Joe. Another time. Now I want to hear. How did you get him to take it? How did I get him to take it? I... Yes. Well, I... I always made his coffee for him. Coffee? Yes. One night I put a pinch of this... of this poison in his cup. I remember that evening how very much like this it was, how peaceful. He, he gasped a little, tried to move from his chair, but he couldn't. Presently, he died. How much... How much was the insurance money? About 2,000 pounds. I speculated. I lost it. It was over two years before I, before I married again. He was a much younger man, quite well off. There was a will in my favor. He liked me to make his coffee, too, just as my first husband had done. I make very good coffee. Alex! It was the same, along about twilight. Alex. I remember it perfectly. How nervous and upset I'd been all day, wondering if it would turn out all right. Coffee. But it did. It was the same as the other. He just sat there in his chair, and, and he died. Our village doctor pronounced it heart failure. Alex. My husband did have a weak heart, you see, and that, and that helped a great deal. Alex, listen! That netted me over 4,000 pounds. I didn't speculate. Well, coffee. That's why I tasted it that way. You did you poisoned me. <laughs> you poisoned me. Yes. Yes, I did. Yes, you. No. And already the poison is working. I'll you see? Kill you. I'll move from your chair. Lying. Lying. I'll kill you. You can't move. You're helpless. I'll kill you. Someone you knew nothing about. I certainly knew nothing about. Excuse me, sir. What did the find from? A man sitting in his chair. Heart trouble, it looks like, sir. And, and yes, will sir. He's dead. Your husband, ma'am. My, my, you might say a, a perfect stranger. He was just just sitting in his chair, and, and presently. He died. And so closes Philomel Cottage, Agatha Christie's story of love from a stranger, starring Geraldine Fitzgerald and Orson Welles. Tonight's tale of suspense. This is your narrator, the man in black, who conveys to you Columbia's invitation to spend this half hour in suspense with us on October 19th, one week from Tuesday, when Orson Welles will again be our star. Our next broadcast in the series will be Tuesday, October 19th, at 10 o'clock Eastern Wartime, 7 o'clock Pacific Wartime. The producer of Suspense is William Spear, who tonight also directed the broadcast, and who with Wilbur Hatch and Lucian Marlowick, conductor and composer, and Harold Medford, the radio author, collaborated on tonight's Suspense. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.